Bowie had very Go sit down beside her. So good morning, everybody. Welcome to the um, ICANN Open Forum. My name is Chris Despain. I am a board member of ICANN. It's nice to see some familiar faces, but also some less familiar faces, which is good because this is uh, 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 about um, ICANN in the context of the IGF. The way we're going to do this is it's going to be an, an open discussion, hopefully. Um, you will see that there are seats at the table where there are microphones. If you want to speak, you can either come and sit here and speak, or we have a roving microphone. We're going to take a little time at the very beginning of this to hear from um, some members of the board briefly. So I'm going to introduce the, the panel, and then Martin Bottomen is going to say a few opening remarks, and then we'll get started. So from my, from my left, it's Ron De Silva, uh, David Conrad, Becky Burr, Martin Bottomen, Lito Ibarra, and Joran Mabi. And Martin, would you like to start us off before I ask, a, I ask the opening question? Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, today, 50 years after the start of the internet as we know it, uh, 21 years after the start of ICANN, and three years after the transition uh, of IANA, uh, which makes ICANN an independent body that is ruled by its stakeholders. Uh, the internet works, and we've all seen the, and experienced the benefits of a global internet that changed the way we communicate uh, uh, how we disseminate knowledge and how we grow our economies. Uh, we see upcoming exponential new changes like the Internet of Things and uh, also 5G and uh, uh, artificial intelligence will affect how we use this. So this is all moving. Uh, so far the multi-stakeholder system has proven us to be able to make this work together. And our focus as ICANN as part of making the internet work is a clear focus on the security and stability of the unique identifier system. So with that, uh, uh, we want to continue this multi-stakeholder way to uh, continue. That's that the basis of how we work. Transparency and accountability are key in that. So new challenges come up every day. We talk about some of them here and we're ready to address them. Uh, with that, I would also like to draw your attention to the five-year strategic plan that is published on the ICANN site, and where for 2020 to 2025, we uh, mention the main five areas that we're going to focus on. Security, uh, development of the DNS system, uh, global go uh, governance development, uh, but also how we can further improve our multi-stakeholder system to remain functional and effective, and last but not least, to make sure that we continue to afford all this. So that's an excellent basis for, I think, the discussion today. And Chris, please, take Thanks, the Thanks, So I'm going to start with a question for the four, for four members of the panel, for Ron and for David and for Becky and for Lito. And, and I'm, I'm going to ask you to talk for no more than three minutes each on your thoughts on what you think are the key opportunities and threats for the DNS over the next five years. Martin, Martin's mentioned the five years of our strategic plan. So key opportunities, key threats, three minutes, Lito. Thank you, Chris. This is Lito Ibarra. Uh, I would like to refer to two major topics brief, briefly. One of them is the emerging technologies, uh, such as blockchain, uh, DOT, DOH, protocols and technologies, I mean. And I think they can be viewed both as a threat or as an opportunity. Uh, they are, as the word uh, says, emerging. They are still under study, some of them. And uh, 
they may become an opportunity for thinking uh, out of the box and uh, developing or uh, doing uh, the DNS in some other way. So the domain name resolution uh, uh, in some other way. So that is why, but they haven't been tried uh, fully to the full extent. So I think they are both uh, an opportunity and may be a threat to the, to the DNS. And the second uh, uh, topic I would like to mention is uh, a threat, which is the DNS abuse. But I would also like to, to mention that uh, uh, we in ICANN and in some other organizations, we have uh, in place some mechanisms to uh, know, to, to research, and to prevent maybe this uh, DNS abu abuse. We have the DNS abuse activity reporting system, and uh, we are uh, doing that with the generic top-level domains, which are, as you know, the general like .info, .com, etc. But we have opened that also uh, as, an, uh, as a. We have uh, placed this uh, as available also for the country code top-level domains. So. Uh, with that, I think it's an opportunity for us all. Uh, I mean that we are in the in the DNS industry to try to reduce uh, DNS abuse in its many forms. So I'll stick with that. Thank you. Thank you, Lito. Becky. Thank you, um, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I think that. Um, the, the uh, biggest threat and opportunity, as, as Lito said, threats and opportunities are often tied together. And um, critical to ICANN's mission is stability and security. I, I'm hearing a big feedback. Is anybody else? Yeah. It's weird. Um, uh, so I think cybersecurity um, and the security of the root server system is, uh, needs to be mission one. Um, and fortunately, um, the root server uh, community is coming together and working with ICANN and, and so uh, RSAC 37 and 38, um, those opportunities to understand precisely how um, ICANN uh, interacts and supports an independent root server system, um, a, a robust uh, independent root server system that can withstand um, the kind of massive attacks that uh, are increasingly prevalent is a, is a major um, uh, it's a major opportunity for us that I think we're posed to take advantage of and uh, uh, doing so. In terms of threats, Lido mentioned abuse, and um, I, I think that the, uh, the, the global uh, nature of the internet um, creates special uh, concerns that we have to be aware of tied to the, the need to understand what um, creative ways we can um, address abuse without stepping on civil liberties um, is an important uh, part of uh, the thinking that we all as members of the internet community need to do this. There are many things that are not within ICANN's remit. But in terms of threat, I think um, we do have a, a threat of um, the, the, the issue uh, sort of overtaking us um, and having uh, governments legislate in ways that don't make sense for a, in a global environment. So I think we need to um, think carefully about uh, how we can work together um, uh, to address these issues uh, without uh, legislating in ways that make no sense given the technology. Thanks, Becky. Ron. Thanks. I want to talk uh, about threats and opportunities with the domain name system as an ecosystem. Uh, specifically on the opportunities, uh, we have pretty much concluded a, a, a round of uh, new 
uh, top level domains, uh, which introduced some 1,500 or so new strings into the DNS system. And uh, that introduction uh, created a lot of new commerce, a lot of new activities, a lot of new operators, a lot of new uh, uh, revenue. Ron, can I yes. stop you for one second? I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we're obviously having problems with the trans. Can you try to use the mobile microphone that Franco is going to give you? See if that makes any difference. Just try and see. Does this make any difference? Doesn't seem to be, does it? It still says microphone. So we obviously have a problem. OK, in that case, just carry on using whichever microphone is easier for you. OK, I'll use this one since I'm now holding it. I mean, you're holding it so well as well. Thank you, Chris. So an opportunity, back to um, the topic at hand, um, the opportunity that I see is, you know, we've, we, uh, we just concluded this uh, last round introducing a lot of uh, growth in, in the domain name system, uh, a lot of new operators, a lot of new revenues. Uh, and we're in the process in, in, uh, in ICANN uh, in finalizing the procedures for a subsequent round or subsequent rounds to be able to introduce additional uh, top level names into the DNS system. And I think as an opportunity in the ecosystem, that's really uh, the potential for additional growth, potential for additional expression of um, uh, brands and, and of uh, ideas and of uh, uh, you know, labels in, in the domain, sp domain name space that uh, have real commerce value. So that's an opportunity. Certainly, we talk about the five-year timeline. Um, I see that as you know, some, some, some great uh, activity that, that, that could happen. And, um, Similarly, uh, talking about the ecosystem, uh, I think a threat, um, we didn't really coordinate it ahead of time, so I, we, uh, there's a theme here that I'm hearing across the table about uh, abuse. I want to talk slightly differently on the abuse side of it uh, to kind of complement what Becky and Lito have already said, and that is I think of the consumer side of it. As, as more consumer abuse happens on the Internet, and specifically as uh, DNS is leveraged in some way to either... Um, uh, you know, masquerade uh, real uh, legitimate websites with uh, fraudulent websites. You think of um, commerce, you think of uh, fraud, uh, and, uh, and other crimes being conducted uh, under the guise of the internet and being labeled with uh, the dom domain name system itself. All those things create attention, uh, like Becky said, from regulators and from law enforcement agents uh, across the globe. And um, those regulations can come in, in in a way to help protect consumers in, uh, in disruptive ways for the way the internet actually works. So that I see, you know, kind of complementing uh, what, what Becky and, and Lito said is, is certainly in the next five years a, a real threat to, to the ecosystem uh, if we don't keep in mind the, the importance of protecting end users on the internet. Thank you, Ron. So we've got one more, one more uh, speaker, and then um, I'm going to throw it open to everyone in the room to ask questions, to make comments, uh, not, not just about what we've, what we've heard here, but other things as well. So get ready for that. David, over to you. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, one of the nice things about going last is everyone actually gives you all the ideas to actually talk about. Um, so in, in terms of opportunities, I think uh, one of the thing, uh, one of, the, one of the, the most important opportunities that seems to be uh, heading our way over the next five years is the sort of the diversification of business models associated with uh, top-level domains. Um, yeah, the um, traditional model of, of uh, sort of open, generic uh, top-level domains seems to be uh, pretty much saturated across the, the industry. Um, but there are new business models that have some interesting uh, attributes, you know, tying in, for example, blockchains or tying in uh, application development and that sort of thing. Um, so I, th I believe that there are probably a, uh, a raft of, of new opportunities that are being driven by these uh, new business models associated with uh, the domain name system. Um, and that's just talking to top level domains. When you start looking at um, how the DNS is actually used, um, the potential of uh, domain-based authentication of named entities, also known as DANE, um, can provide an infrastructure that can be used for uh, uh, improved security uh, replacement or uh, addition to existing public key uh, infrastructures, which I think um, provides for an opportunity of actually um, improving the use of the DNS. 
In terms of threats, I sort of go along with uh, Ron in the sense that um, my, my biggest concerns are related to how the uh, ecosystem in which the DNS operates is increasingly targeted uh, as a way of uh, compromising end users and uh, organizations. The uh, recent attacks that were documented by Cisco Talos and CrowdStrike uh, against the infrastructure, the DNS infrastructure, particularly uh, registries and registrars, is particularly worrying because of the potential impact uh, that um, those attacks can have on the ability to trust the underlying naming system. You know, fundamentally, I think that <clears throat> we need to uh, increase the trust in the, uh, the DNS ecosystem and the challenges that we're facing with these uh, particular sets of attacks that target the, the infrastructure is it does risk undermining that trust um, so that you cannot really rely that the name that you're looking up actually translates into uh, what you're uh, wanting to go to. And with that, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, David. So that's, that's a fair whack of interesting topics there. DNS abuse, cybersecurity, root, the root servers, governments legislating locally rather than globally, subsequent rounds, opportunities for growth, consumer abuse, diversification of business models, and the ecosystem being used to attack consumers. But there are heaps of other things you might want to discuss or talk about. The only thing I would ask is that, remembering this is not an ICANN meeting, it's an IGF, if we could keep things away from sort of intensely internal ICANN stuff, which no, nobody apart from those of us who are ICANN geeks are really interested in, just deal with other stuff. That would be fantastic. So, who would like to start with the first comment or question? Sir, there's a microphone right there. If you could, if you could tell us who you are and where you're from then. Thank you very much. My name is Bara Kotieno from the Kenya Internet Governance Forum. And uh, my question to the audience, or to the panel, and both the audience, is um, uh, one of the biggest threats, in my opinion, which none of the panelists has talked about, is um, um, ignoring the end user. Maybe we'll call the end user, or we'll call them the registrant, because these are the people who keep the internet going. And uh, the more we purport to represent them, but at times not really represent the interest on the ground, to me it's the biggest threat to the DNS ecosystem. So even as we go forward, I'm really keen to understand um, whether you feel that um, the registrant, because even in the domain name ecosystem we talk of the 3R model, but we've just been focusing on the registry and the registrar. A lot of time there is a superficial talk about the registrant, but I do feel that this is one of the biggest threats that we need to address and we are not paying sufficient attention to it. Could you give us an example of how of something you think could be done that is would be focused on registrants? Do you have an example of something? Yes. Um, I desire to see probably more evidence um, uh, best research on what exactly end users, the kind of internet that the end users want. Because in all the sittings that I have been within the ICANN ecosystem, uh, re conversations around registrars are very clear, very solid. Conversations around registries are very clear, very solid. But the issue of the end user is still not very clear to me. Okay. Does anyone want to respond to that? Don't all rush at once. Martin. Sure. Thank you, Barack, for this question. Um, as you know, uh, we do build it in, in our uh, ecosystem, and, and ICANN is a bottom-up organization where end users are represented too. And the aim is from the build to stakeholder system that we've built together to really respect what's coming up through that uh, to the to the bottom and and uh, for us as board is also very crucial that we listen well to that becky 
So d just echoing the multi-stakeholder model theme, um, obviously we do have the, the, uh, the use of the term end user is confusing because sometimes obviously um, we're talking about registrants, but more often we're talking about internet users when we say end users. Um, I think that there are lots of examples of uh, issues where registrant um, the interests of registrants are uh, primarily are primary pieces of the conversation. The conversation that we're having uh, in ICANN related to access to who is uh, registrant information is obviously um, a, a, an issue that's critically important to registrants as well as to the rest of the uh, community. Um, issues. Uh, related to choice and expansion uh, of the space um, are also issues that are important to reg existing and potential registrants. So I, I, I don't think that, um, I think it's an interesting observation that we don't say registrant interests um, uh, often, but I think we're actually almost always thinking about that in the work that we do. Thank you, Becky. Do you want to, anything else you want to say? You're done? Okay. Next question or next comment, anybody else? It's going to be a very short session if no one else has anything to, ha, sir, go ahead. Good day, uh, my name is Mikhail Anisimov, uh, Russian IGF and Russian Registry of .ru. I would like to express some concerns regarding the uh, proper use of some emerging technologies. These concerns are widely uh, discussed by some stakeholder groups in different countries and in Russia in particular. Uh, you, you, you know, uh, using of DOH uh, makes uh, a lot of governments and law enforcement to completely revise the existing cybersecurity ecosystem because, generally speaking, we are talking about the DNS traffic hijacking that completely ruins the efforts of law enforcement in malicious content blocking. And it have to, um, uh, all the corporate standards also have to be revised. So, uh, moreover, we are talking about some uh, corporate segments of the internet, the internet that belongs to Google or, for example, Cloudflare. That is also a type of fragmentation. It's not widely discussed uh, compared to, for example, state fragmentations, but it's also very important. So uh, does ICANN have any recommendations or any action plans regarding this issue? Thank you. I'm going to ask David to at least start us off. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, thanks for the question, because um, DOH is a, uh, a significant topic of uh, interest and discussion in, in, uh, in a large number of venues. Um, to be clear, uh, the, the DOH protocol um, is uh, simply a way of encrypting the uh, communication from applications or end users to um, the, the part of the DNS that does uh, the lookup. Um, the question, or the, the interesting bit, um, really re revolves around how you deploy uh, DOH. Um, the models that are currently being uh, implemented by Google, uh, Mozilla, and Microsoft um, vary, uh, and um, in some cases, they actually promote um, the increased encryption of uh, the communication between the end user and the resolver um, without actually changing the, the architecture of how the DNS uh, operates. Um, in other cases, uh, the, the DNS queries from the end user are actually exported out of the, the uh, local network and the uh, network operator to someone like uh, Google or Cloudflare, um, what are known as trusted recursive resolvers. Um, and that has an interesting uh, impact in the sense that it, it provides some uh, assurance uh, to the application um, that uh, the information that it receives hasn't been modified by the intervening network operators, but it does result 
in uh, bypassing of network controls that might be imposed uh, either by legal mandate or uh, by commercial interests. Um, these uh, topics about you know, how DOH is being deployed are, a, are a, an ongoing discussion um, in a number of venues. Uh, I know it was a, a, a topic of uh, discussion at the recent IETF uh, in Singapore. It continues to be discussed. Um, within the context of ICANN, we don't really have an opinion because it's sort of below um, or above, depending on your point of view, uh, the areas that ICANN um, org is actually able to uh, address. However, um, my team uh, in the office of the CTO actually wrote a, a paper very recently. Um, you can find it uh, on the ICANN website, if you can find anything on the ICANN website, um, that actually talks about um, DOH, uh, it actually talks about encrypting uh, the DNS because there are uh, other mechanisms to to do the encryption um, and tries to address sort of uh, the, the common points um, that, uh, at least from uh, the ICANN perspective, um, we believe are important. So I'd recommend uh, you know, taking a look at that paper um, and engaging in the discussions because it is, um, it does, as you say, uh, indicate a, a sort of a shift depending on how it's deployed. Um, in how uh, the DNS from the end user perspective actually operates. So thanks for the question. Thank you, David. This gentleman here. Uh, thank you, uh, Andrew Campling. Uh, I, uh, I'm a director of 419 Consulting, which is a public affairs, public policy consultancy. Um, it's a coincidence I happen to be sat uh, here. I was actually at uh, ITF in Singapore all last week. Um, and was going anyway to uh, raise a question uh, about DOE, uh, which in my view is a standard or change to, to uh, the DNS, which has a real risk of driving a huge amount of centralization uh, in the internet uh, infrastructure, um, and at the same time delivers some new um, ways for tech companies to uh, uh, breach privacy um, and monetize data of, of end users uh, in ways which are very hard for the end users to detect, be aware of, or stop uh, because of the way the protocol uh, is designed. Um, uh, and also the way the protocol is designed causes immense problems to enterprises um, in terms of their cybersecurity uh, efforts. So it's hugely disruptive to uh, uh, enterprise uh, uh, networks. Um, and I think part of the problem uh, is that the way the standards at ITF uh, evolve um, typically lack input from policymakers. They're driven by technologists largely without uh, the, the uh, benefit of policymakers being in the room, let alone contributing to the discussion. Um, so things like the ability to filter content to block uh, child sex abuse material or even malware dissemination uh, are viewed as hugely contentious topics in ITF, uh, even though um, I think in other fora those will be viewed as common sense things you would want to use DNS as a control plane for. Um, that will be disputed uh, in ITF. So question for the panel, really, just building on the last one, uh, is... Do you agree that policymakers should be involved in the way that internet standards are set in the future, um, so they're not just driven by technologists who may have, um, shall we say, commercial uh, exploitation at the heart of the changes that they're driving? So, so on the basis that answering that question does not mean you necessarily agree with the tail of the question, <laughs> but do you think that policymakers should be more involved in the technical standards at the ITF is a, is a really good question. So, Ron, go ahead. Yeah, I think it's, it's a great question um, and perhaps a little better character, characterization of the majority of the participants in the standards development at the IETF are, as you say, technologists, but perhaps from operators, researchers, uh, equipment suppliers, and they are, um, I don't think, uh, trying to uh, s somehow, you know, take advantage of uh, commercial opportunities, but they're actually pursuing the, the interests of 
uh, their employers and the businesses they represent um, with, you know, with the intent of building infrastructure that is valuable and useful for, for the growth of the internet. And it is um, definitely an open environment where uh, anybody's uh, allowed to participate and is uh, um, able to, to join in and, and contribute and definitely having uh, different voices and, and uh, um, policymakers in particular weighing in, uh, either through uh, some of those equipment suppliers or researchers or operators or even uh, directly participating in, in the standards processes is, is definitely uh, uh, an opportunity um, that, is, uh, that is there and uh, should be exercised, absolutely. Is there a danger of, is there a danger of using the we're not careful of the sort of gun, the gun argument coming in. You know, it's not guns that kill people, it's people. So it's not the technology, it's the way the technology is used. David, do you want to address that? And then Becky? Yeah, the, the challenge that you find is that the IETF focuses primarily on specifications of the protocols, um, sort of de designing the shape and, and weight of a hammer. Um, and the question then becomes how is uh, the subsequent protocol uh, actually used? You know, you know, what do you actually do with the hammer after it's built? In the case of DOH, um, the uh, deployment model that's been chosen by um, uh, two of the three major deployers at this stage um, actually does not change uh, the ability for um, uh, network operators to control uh, traffic because if the uh, DOH server is deployed within the network, then the only difference is that the communication between um, the client and the uh, resolver is encrypted. Uh, the um, same control points that exist now, uh, that is, in the resolver, uh, can continue to be uh, applied. Um, the, the third uh, deployment model um, is, uh, does change the way um, control points can be applied. Um, uh, Mozilla has gone out of their way to try to specify a, a, a set of policies um, that people have to uh, agree to in order to um, become a trusted resolver. Um, but that doesn't change the reality that the uh, information uh, is no longer controllable um, uh, within the context of the network operator. Um, should uh, policymakers be involved in the discussions related to deployment? Um, definitely. Um, it's not clear to me that the, the, you know, how uh, policymakers would be able to be um, sort of usefully involved in the specification of the protocol itself, because we're talking, um, you know, uh, protocol formats and bits and bytes, and um, it requires a certain level of, of technical knowledge. Uh, but the implications of how the, the protocol is deployed, that's definitely an area that I think um, would value from additional input um, uh, uh, across the, the multi stakeholder spectrum. Thanks, David. Becky? I was just going to echo exactly what David said last. Excellent. So we're going to move on now to something else, I hope. Anyone else got any questions or comments about anything that's going on right now? There must be something going on, surely. Not a soul? Wow. OK, well, what I always do in circumstances, ah, there's a hello. Can we get a roving microphone? Thank you, Franco. It's the lady at the back here. If you could put your hand up again, that would be helpful. Or stand up even, thank you. Good morning, this is Suad from Algeria and have been uh, next gen with ICANN in section five. So I have a question, a little bit general in terms of bylaws of ICANN. So does ICANN, um, like can change its bylaws at any time it wishes, or it's not that easy. That's, that's thank you. That absolutely. That, that I know who to ask that question of. Becky. Could I? Oh, Yaren, if you want to say something. So, it's it's not easy. Um, and, and and the reason is, and, and it's very important that it's not re, it's not easy, uh, because changing of the bylaws is is remember the bylaws comes from the community. It's the community decided the, the rules that are set for us, which means that when we go into a process of changing the bylaws, the community has to be involved in that. 
And, and in the end, in the process, just to give you an example of it, the, the, we, the community has what we call an empowered community. In the end, the community has to say yes to change with bylaws. So, so it might be seen as complicated, but it, the, the system is built to make it extremely transparent, uh, really accountable, and also predictable. So uh, I would say it's not a bad thing that sometimes things go slowly. Uh, because that means that you can have more people on board and having opinions about it. But it is sometimes problematic, yes. Thank yeah, you. Do you want to say something, Peggy? No? You're, okay, Jan's covered it. Does that answer your question? Did that answer your question? Yeah? Okay, good. Could I actually make Sorry. a comment about the previous one? Because I want to point out that ITF is, of course, a different organization than us. And in ICANN's policy-making process, we have invited governments uh, as a part of our, uh, the GAC. So from an ICANN perspective, we've seen it's, it's important to have different parts of, of the internet users around the world participating in the ICANN policy-making process, including governments. Thank you. Thanks, Jaren. Sorry. Good morning. Uh, my name is Lori Schulman from the International Trademark Association. And um, I have a suggestion for the board. Um, as we all know, in the last week, um, the ICANN board, the ICANN community was, was taken aback a little bit about a proposed transaction of the transfer of .org from um, the stewardship of ISOC to a private equity firm. And there's a lot of unanswered questions. We know this. And we also are aware that it puts the board and the community in the middle of, of some hot debates about what should or shouldn't be happening at the moment with .org. So I have a suggestion for the board when it's going through its analysis of whether or not this is an actual item, um, and if so, what actions may or may not be taken within the parameters of, of ICANN's remit. And my suggestion is this, not just to look at recent um, history, but to look at past history itself, and to look at the premises behind the bid, why the bid happened, the commitments ISOC made at the time of the bid, um, there are many of us, um, I now represent interests that, that form a much broader spectrum today than I did 15 years ago, but I was a member of a, a non-profit organization that was recruited to advise on the proper running of, of a non-profit organization that might have this large social responsibility to maintain .org. And at the time, it was conveyed to all of us who had an interest in this that this was about maintaining a public access asset for the good of the public community. And whatever happens now in terms of what may or may not be possible in terms of the transfer, I think it's very important to look at the premise. Because it's through that that we may find a remedy and a solution or perhaps open a dialogue about what may be a resolution to a very thorny issue for everybody. Thanks, Laurie. Um, so I know you know that we're, I know you know that we're not going to Get, obviously going to get into into much detail, although I will ask Martin to, or, and or Yaron to respond in a second. But but thank you very much for the for the suggestion and the point you make about the about the history is is, is an important one. Martin, do you want to say anything? No, exactly Yaron? that. Yaron, uh, you, you said go it well. So, I mean, first of all, um, but yes, we will look into this, um, and the board will look into this from from the perspective that's needed. But I, I want to point out that. We have, of course, been approached by many people over the last week about this, and my, as you said, I was, and I speak for the board as well, were as surprised as everybody else. We didn't know. With that said, I also think that a lot of those discussions should be taken to ISOC. Um, they are the decision maker about and, and how they deal with it, uh, and, and ISOC, don't forget to talk to ISOC. Um, ICANN has a, a role in this, but ISOC is the role. Thank you. Thanks, Yaren. Yeah, Laurie, you want to come back? Yeah. Yaren, I think your point is really well taken, but I also think the point goes to this greater um, mission of ICANN about being the steward of the DNS, and this is essential to the DNS, so I get your point. This was an ISOC action, but the ISOC action is having reverberations across the board, so yes, I would agree that not only do we talk to ISOC, but I think this is, this is an issue that is, uh, supersedes ISOC in many ways. Thanks, Laurie. Do we have anyone else who'd like to bring up a topic or raise a question? Yes. Uh, 
Thank you so much. My name is Lisa Vermeer. Um, I have a question and that might have been brought up in the first five minutes because I ran in a little bit late. But in the session description, it's mentioned that you will touch upon the recent uh, initiative to track legislation and regulation, um, especially one, uh, the, the legislation that touches upon the functionality of the internet. I'm really interested to hear more, especially because I think analysis of regulation, national and regional and international, it's really necessary to be able to respond in a correct way. Thank you very much. Yaren, you want to? Thank you. So, so what we're trying to do here is to add, I mean, ICANN is a technical organization and not a political one, but we have seen legislative proposals that can have an effect on ICANN's ability, ICANN community's ability to make policies, or sometimes even disconnect people from the internet itself. And, and we see that, we see that from, from what you would call friendly countries as well, because it's, it's obvious that when you, when you come into legislation, sometimes it's hard to, even if you have a good will, and if you don't understand how the internet works, it could be problematic when you actually write the legislation. So what we've done is that together with our community, with input from our community all around the world, uh, they're giving us inputs about legislative proposals that can have this effect. And then we are establishing a, a point together with the community that we can then work with the governments uh, in those cases the governments are interested in for, as a technical advisor. But we will never take a stand about the policy as itself because that belongs to other for us like this. Uh, we are only there to tell that, and I can give you a practical example. Uh, we engage with, with one country who wrote, is writing a privacy law. And we have no opinion about the privacy law, but the way it was written, it could actually disconnect end users from the internet itself. And we didn't think that was a good idea, so we can be a technical advisor to it. We're working on a way also so we can make this as transparent as possible together with our community. I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Behind me. Hello, sir. Thank you very much. My name is Abdi Kariman from Nigeria. I want to take us a little bit back to the question of the bylaw. I totally agree with the fact that it should not be easy to change the bylaws. I think one thing we need to address is the issue of some communities being more powerful than some communities within ICANN. So we need to try as much as possible to, especially when you look at the communities that holds the financial aspect of things, this seems to be much more powerful than some of the other communities. And that is why we need to balance things to be able to change, if there is a need to change some things. Thank you. So that's an interesting, an interesting point. In, 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 in fact, um, we've, just, we've just been through a bylaw change, uh, uh, not, a, not a stupendously uh, community-wide important bylaw change, but a very small change uh, to a bylaw that affects the, the CCNSO, the Country Code Named Supporting Organisation. But in order to get that done, it was actually necessary to get agreement from all of the other, or not, if not all, most of the uh, three of the other um, uh, SOs or ACs. So there are built into the new bylaws, the bylaws that came following uh, the, the, uh, the transition, uh, a raft of uh, protections to ensure that one particular part of the community doesn't run away uh, with with things and changing changing the bylaws. Um, that's one point. I think that the I think that the point about other parts of the, certain parts of the community at least appearing to be more powerful than others is a valid point outside of the bylaws. It's just a gen more of a general point, but I but I would agree with that. Does anybody on the panel, Martin, go ahead. Well, I, f I think, the, the, again, you said most of it. Uh, uh, crucially, we've built up ICANN together in a bottom-up way, in a way where we do reflect uh, all the interests and we make it uh, for sure mandatory that, that they're all heard and, and that they're part of the process when decision-taking is taking place. So how this plays out? It will never be perfect. We cannot invite three and a half billion internet users to directly take part. But the system we built up is the best possible guarantee we see. And we're also looking into how we further can improve that, being aware that the world changes and we need to change with it. Thank you. 
Any other questions? I'm going to ask Yaren to make some remarks in a second, and on the basis that there may be some questions after Yaren has made his remarks. Let's do that now and see if anybody wants to say anything afterwards. Yaren, go ahead. Thank you for setting me up. Now, I, I think this discussion is so something that I often think about is that many people seem to think the internet is sort of done, we can move on, and it's already there, everybody has it. Uh, but the truth is that um, if, you, if you look on the, how to get the next billion users of internet, uh, who primarily will come from rural areas, will not be the elite that already have the internet today, um, who will have other financial opportunities to, to even have access, um, the ability to use internet on their own premise, in their own local language, their own, uh, their own script. Uh, that's one of the uh, uh, challenges we have. The other one are, as we talked about, increased security issues surrounding the DNS and, and, and the end users of the world that we see. And I, I, uh, this is why I think the involvement in the organization, and I'm of course talking because I believe so, uh, in ICANN and other parts of this ecosystem is going to be even more important going forward because we're not done. Um, we, we are taking some things for granted because it's been existing for a fairly long time. And, and now we see a lot of challenges to things. And if we forget this basic idea that we believe that internet is a good thing and by connecting people something magical happens, I think we can be in really, really big troubles. So I will, as, as I always do, I, mean, I, call, I, I sometimes call internet or ICANN one of the largest peace projects ever. Uh, because we bring people together from all over the world with different opinions, different ideas, and, and through that we actually come up with consensus policies that shapes how uses of the internet happens around the world. And I just want to invite everybody to continue to come to ICANN, continue to, to come to the IGF and participate as this, uh, because through those meetings we develop something that needs to be developed. So, thank you. Thanks, Jaron. So I'm going to ask for one, one final call for, for any other comments or questions. Does anyone on the panel want to say anything in closing? Anyone in the audience want to say anything? Yes, sir. Again, no problem. Sorry, once again. Um, the question I want to ask has to do with, because we all know Africa has the poorest connectivity when it comes to internet. And when it comes to ICANN presence, I know ICANN does not have a direct relationship with connectivity, but ICANN has a role to play. And when it comes to presence of ICANN in Africa, I think it's also the poorest. So I think it's something we need to look at because there is an indirect role that ICANN has to play to help with connectivity in Africa. Thank you. Yara. I, yeah. As you know, my friend, we, since I joined ICANN, we have had three ICANN meetings in, in Africa, two in Marrakesh and, and one in South Africa. So we are there. Um, but, but you're right. I mean, I think the realization that has come over the last four or five years, I mean, internet is still young, is that we need to find new cooperation methods. We, yes, we have nothing to do with access. We, ICANN as an institution doesn't have any business ideas or business interests. But one of the reasons, for instance, we joined ITUD is because we realized we have to work together uh, in, in new ways to be able to connect the next billion users, which primarily will be in Africa, South America, and Asia. Um, I think that the internet penetration right now in Africa is about 25% or something, which is actually a double from three or four years ago. But still, it's still only the elite. It's only the cities. It's not the rural areas. So we are engaging with, with uh, the ISOC chapters, for instance. We are engaging with ITUD. We are engaging with, with uh, interested governments to talk about uh, and see what we can do to be part of that system. I think everybody realizes that the old sort of economical way of doing things will not benefit the next billion users. And we, we are a part of it. We don't have the solution um, to all of it, uh, but we are trying to figure out a way how to cooperate also in Africa. And here is important that it's not like we're coming with a pre-fixed solution because we don't know the answers to all the questions. And that's why engagement with, with the chapters at, at large uh, in, in, uh, in our own chapters, in, in uh, our own structures in Africa is increasingly important it's because we have to learn. I mean, the, the local scripts um, is, is just one example with the, with the language panels we have, for instance, in Africa. 
Well, I can talk at length, every, any board member, anyone can talk at length about this because this is something that we, we want to spend more time on. This is something that we think is so important because it's the reason for ICANN existing. We want to connect people. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. One thing you have not done that I would like ICANN to do is to recruit more staff from Africa. Recruit more staff from Africa. I mean, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so ICANN Org is a fairly small organization, and we are currently have people in 35 countries around the world, and also in Africa, as you know. And, and, and there is a long list of, of uh, there is a long list of countries and regions who wants us to put more people there, but it sort of misses the point actually, because ICANN is not about ICANN Org staff. I, it's about the community who works there, and we serve that community. And, and so we're working with in Africa community, as you well know. Uh, to try to bring more people into that community because the work in ICANN is done by the community, not by ICANN Org. We are there to facilitate it. Um, so an active and vibrant participation in ICANN from Africa is something we are trying to help as well. And you know that we have outreach programs, we, we have the Next Gen program, uh, and that's also one of the reasons why we had free meetings in Africa over the last couple of years, to create a more, uh, more community members active in, in Africa. David? Yeah, just to, with that said, and I agree, of course, obviously, with, uh, with my boss, uh, but, but I, I will say that um, as an advertisement, we are actually trying to recruit a technical engagement specialist in Africa, so um, check on ICANN's uh, uh, job board. <laughs> Thanks, David. Martin? Good. Now, just to express that um, uh, with all the presence, and we hear you, and, and we think about Africa also in the board, and, and we are very uh, aware of the, the huge interest for benefiting from this and, and, and considering what that means. So in that way, we do it, take it very seriously, and we're very happy with two new African board members that uh, we believe will play a major role in the way forward and also the deeper understanding of the issues. Uh, and, so and I'm not going to say anything against my boss, I just want to add, we now have three board members from Africa because Manal is from Egypt. Jolly good. Yes, Manal. Thank you, Wafi Dehmeni, MAG member. Just I wanted to react with Abdel Karim about the issue of promoting access in Africa. Actually, I can see that ICANN will help us to promote the access in Africa. It's a local problem, it's a local issue, local uh, problem that we can be solved uh, locally. I think there are two main dima policy dimensions for this issue. issue. The, the first one is the uh, deploying the infrastructure, and the second one is uh, uh, bringing online users. It's true that uh, deploying the infrastructure is the key driver for the internet access, but also bringing uh, users online is, par is, a, is paramount to promote the access. You can see if to deploy infrastructure, we can think in uh, Africa to promote the uh, um, partnership between public and private sector, which uh, for me a very important issue today. We, we don't rely only on the government, on the public public um, uh, sector. Also, we can uh, deploy IXPs to bring down the cost, which is a problem today in Africa. We can also encourage deployment of IPv6 to make the internet sus sustainable. And we need also to bring users uh, online. We have to, for, for example, provide applications for these users to use this internet to make, uh, for example, online services and to think about multilingualism. We have many people who can't use the internet because of the language. So I think it's a local problem that we have to solve it locally. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well said. And on the subject of uh, other languages and, and multilingualism, etc., there are a number of sessions during this IGF on universal acceptance, which of course is a major part of getting uh, not just um, new GTLDs in ASCII, but CCTLDs and GTLDs in other scripts uh, readable. So it's an, uh, I'd encourage everyone to go along to those and, and help to uh, bring about universal acceptance. Are there any last questions or comments before we close? Well, if there aren't, then I just, ah, there is another hand. Sir, you did have your hand up. <laughs> um, <clears throat> my name is Eberhard Blocher from Germany, and I'd just like to uh, recap the um, issue we had a couple of minutes ago about the PIR sale. And uh, we had an ISOC meeting, a German chapter meeting on Sunday, 
And of course, we also talked about this issue, although of course the German chapter is not involved, it's ISOC generally. But I'm, I'd like to ask the ICON board if um, this is perhaps, of course, it's, as you said, it's not an ICON issue, it's, a, it's an ISOC issue. But still, um, we have been, or I've been thinking that the reason for this sale might have been that the ISOC um, uh, board might consider the age of um, permanent domain growth to be over. And that's why they decided to do that. Now, my question to ICON would be, do you share that idea that perhaps the times of permanent growth of domain regis registrations might be over? Because ultimately, I think even ICON finances are basically based on the number of domains or the number of, of GTLDs, obviously. So what is your view to the future, your vision? How will the domain industry be like in 10 years from now? Thank you for what is an exceptionally good question. Uh, you are on your light is on, so I assume that means you'd like to start. It seems like it's me. I mean, the interesting thing with that suggestion is that on the other side, there is someone who is an investor who seems to think the opposite. And I, I always think that the market is better to, to exponentially say what they believe, because one of them are, is right and one of them is wrong. I don't think that anyone is really right or wrong. So it's hard for us to answer that question, but it seems like other ones believes in this industry. Remember, I can, in that sense, we're not part of this industry. We provide a service to the world uh, through the main name system. So we don't really, but I'll give you a hint. Uh, we, are soon, we have released our five-year strategic and operating plan where we go through, for instance, our funding and all of that. So you can find a lot of information you ask for there. But again, I will I would say that the, the discussion about PIR, yes, I can is involved in it in that sense. We have a, a role in it, but the real discussion belongs to ISOC and its chapters, I think. And, and uh, I encourage you to continue on the conversation there. Thanks, Jaren Ron. To speak directly to your question about the uh, view of the health of the DNS system or the ecosystem, uh, we strongly believe that it's uh, mature and uh, very well functioning and operating and uh, uh, very stable. Uh, and that's reflected, as, as Jorn said, in the five-year um, operating and financial plan. Uh, we, you know, we, we looked at uh, different um, uh, possibilities of, of growth, whether, you know, uh, sort of a, uh, a range of uh, what the growth might look like over the next five years from, from an overall um, industry perspective and took sort of a conservative view, and that's still growth. Um, what, uh, what maybe is, if you look historically, what's uh, this is kind of my comments at the beginning about um, we had you know, pretty significant growth associated with the last round. What's not reflected in our five-year uh, financial and operating plan is will we see something similar with the next round? We, we really don't know, right? There's a lot of uh, uncertainty about um, how, 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 uh, how large the next round is and what the impact would be, but certainly there will be an impact. Um, so there's some growth opportunity there, but um, if you're specifically thinking about one top level domain and the growth within that, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of folks that are, that are experts in, in the, uh, running a registry and, and perhaps would argue uh, whether that particular top level is saturated or whether it just needs more marketing or more, uh, more effort and promotion uh, in order to get uh, additional um, registrations in it. So I'm, there's, uh, overall, the, the, the industry is, is very healthy and robust. Um, that particular situation, you know, there's probably opinions all over the map on uh, what the growth opportunities are, and perhaps that's what motivated this, uh, this proposed transaction as well. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. So we're going to wrap it up. Can you please join me in thanking the panel? And thank you all for coming, and thank you for the questions and for participating. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you for moderating, Chris. Oh, hang on, there's an announcement. Uh, thank you very much for coming, as Chris said. Uh, ICANN has got a, a, a third session. Uh, universal acceptance was mentioned. We have a, a session on the multilingual internet and universal acceptance on Thursday at 11.05 to 12.35, so please come along to that. And secondly, ICANN, along with ISOC and another, uh, uh, um, another 
various members of the technical community are hosting a reception uh, this evening at uh, 6.30. So if you haven't got your name down for the reception and you'd like to come to the reception, you can visit the ISOC booth or the ICANN booth just out there and uh, register yourself. Thank you.